and I'm very happy to present our next uh, speaker, uh, Rob Conrad, one of our sponsors, Biolitica. Appreciate everything that you Thank are you. doing. Take so it away. Let's see if that's working. Perfect. Wonderful. So um, I'm not a scientist or researcher. I come a bit more from the practical side of things. Um, so I'll keep my presentation a bit more practical as well. Um, and I want to start with a little story about longevity that I recently heard that I really liked and I wanted to share this with you um, before I start with my presentation. And so the story is about this young man who is in search for himself and is in search for you know, finding truth. And so he decides to travel to um, Nepal. And after spending a few weeks in Nepal, he hears about this monastery high up in the mountains where apparently there are some very wise old monks and those monks apparently can answer any question about life. And so he decides, well, let's go to this monastery. And he you now starts to climb the mountain and he climbs the mountain for three days, for three nights, um, in the cold at night, um, exposed to nature. And after three long days and nights of hiking up, he finally reaches the top of the mountain and to his big surprise, he actually finds the monastery. And um, so he approaches the monastery and he sees a monk sitting there outside and um, the monk is meditating. So he approaches the monk and says, and the monk looks at him and says, well, um, young man, we're a very reclusive community, so um, I cannot welcome you to us, but I'm willing to answer you one question, but only one question. And so the young man thinks a little bit, a little bit about this question and then he says, wise old monk, my biggest wish in life is I want to live forever. So how do I do that exactly? And so the monk looks at him and says, well, if your biggest wish in life is you want to live forever, then it's very simple, actually. You need to get married. And the young man looks at the monk and says, well, can you explain it a little bit more detail? Because how would you know, uh, getting married help me with living longer? And the monk says, well, don't misunderstand me. Um, if you get married, it won't help you to, get to live longer, but certainly the wish will go away. So, um, I hope my wife's not watching this, but um, anyway, getting <laughs> into the serious stuff, three ideas for better longevity. Um, I want to just share with you three simple ideas about longevity, really from a more practical um, application, because we work with clinics, we work with uh, practitioners, and these three ideas are um, all connected. And um, yeah, so the first thing is, and that's one thing because I travel to a lot of these conferences. I talk to um, people who are enthusiasts, who are really, you know, trying a lot and experimenting a lot with themselves. And they tell me about their protocols. They tell me what they do, all the supplements they take and everything. And then we talk to clinics, of course, in our business a lot. And they share their interventions and everything they do. Um, but there's one thing that's really hardly ever mentioned. And it kind of makes me mad because I think it's really the most important thing when we talk about reaching longevity and you know, making sure that, that we live longer, healthier. And that one single thing, and don't get me wrong, I think it's great that we have all these interventions and we have the supplements and we have the molecules and we have the clinics and everything, but there's just one thing that's really important if you want to achieve longevity, and that is don't die. And I mean that in a very literal way, because often when we think about longevity interventions, we, we you know, try to optimize, we try to optimize um, certain aspects with supplements, but really what's often forgotten, what's often not talked enough for me, uh, talked about enough for me is that, well, you need to reach a certain age before most of these interventions come to fruition. And often when we talk to clinics, what they, what they do is they, they even often forget about the basics. They even forget to get the basic diagnostics done. They forget to, well, before they talk about interventions, really do the regular checkups. And same with enthusiasts. So not dying is, is, as funny as it may sound, really one of the things that we need to talk more about. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't help us if we build a sports car, which we really optimize and we try to find the perfect engine, we try to find the perfect exhaust and we try to find to the, the perfect engine oil. But then we get, get into the sports car and we drive straight into a wall with closed eyes. And that's sometimes really what we do because often enough, we kind of try to oversight, oversee all these things that we could prevent in terms of um, you know, diseases that could have been avoided or 
potentially something that may, will make us die. So not dying um, is, I believe, very, very important in the sense that take more care of the basics, especially if you work as a clinic. Make sure that you, you and your patients really go through these basic diagnostics. And one of the things that can really help us with that is whole genome sequencing. I believe that whole ge genome sequencing really is our friends. And I'm sure a lot of you have done a DNA test, right? There's lots of companies out there that allow you to do longevity-based uh, DNA tests. And you get some results which are interesting. I mean, there's a company that sounds a little bit like 25 and you, for example, that you get some results from where you can say, okay, you have a 90% probability that your earlobe is attached to uh, your cheek, which is great, but you can see that in a mirror. So the clinical application of that is not really, well, very helpful and very useful. But we have a tool at hand, whole genome sequencing, where we can not only learn about these longevity-relevant interventions but, or characteristics, but really they can help us to really find diseases, diseases that we could avoid that will lead to an early death, potentially. And so whole genome sequencing um, is something I believe we should integrate more, especially if you, if you work as a clinic. Um, the reason why this hasn't been done and why I think this is kind of a white spot for a lot of um, clinics in particular is that in the past it was very and prohibitively expensive. Now, just a few years back, whole genome sequencing was in the six figures, so 150,000. Now the price for the pure sequencing has come down to a few hundred. And so that means we have a tool now where we can not only find things where we can really work from a longevity perspective, but where we can also find diseases uh, of um, that are critical for extended living. And 40% roughly of um, differences in the potential for longevity are based on our genes. And I've heard different numbers yesterday, for example, someone mentioned 25%, so that number is to be debatable. But the genes can really give us a lot of very important and impactful insights, a lot of different things, cardiovascular diseases risk for cancer, sleep disorders, immune system disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, and, and many, many more. So getting this information is not only relevant um, for, from an optimization perspective, but also from a perspective of where are potential walls that we can drive around. Because if I know, for example, that I, I have a risk for cancer that's, that's increased not only from a relative perspective, but from an absolute perspective, well, then I cannot do anything about that risk, but I can make sure that, for example, I check more often, I test more often, I do more, more checkups. And so that's very important to not hit that wall and die early. And another important number is this one, 70%, because 70% is roughly um, the amount of medications which are differently metabolized in your body based on your genes. So every one of you metabolizes different medications in a different way. And understanding that through pharmacogenomics, which we can also get from um, the whole genome sequencing, will allow you to understand what are risk factors, where are these potential walls that you can drive into, um, which could potentially lead to an early death. And one, of, one example I often talk about is um, roughly one in four males has a genetic um, yeah, particularity where one of the most common medications that you get for a heart attack um, will not be metabolized um, very well. So, for example, I'm one of those one in four males that have this um, mutation, and that means that essentially when I have a heart attack and end up in a hospital, um, the medication I'm most likely to get will not really work with me. And then, of course, that could lead to death in, in the worst case. And that's not a big issue because any, med any hospital or any clinic has five, eight, ten different medications typically on stock that you can also give in that case, but you need to know this. You, have, you, need, you need to have this knowledge, and it's not a big deal. Once you've done the test, you can write it on your little emergency card or you put it in your mobile phone, for example, um, and so if you end up in a situation like that, that could be a life-saving thing. And also when we talk about drugs, a lot of people have issues um, like chronic pain issues where they are taking more and more medications, which then in, in, in you know, in exchange lead to other issues um, in their life, but they're not having an issue that's not manageable through pain medications. They're just not taking the right pain medications, for example. So this knowledge is really important to understand more. And um, finally, whole genome sequencing really is something that's future-proof. Yes, one of the most common criticisms about whole genome sequencing is that we don't understand 99% of the things that, that, we, um, no, that we have in front of us. 
But we can always, once we've done the whole genome sequencing, we can always go back to that knowledge. We can always, for example, what we do is with um, um, our providers and also people that we work with directly is um, we send up we send out new reports every three months so people will know exactly okay there's some new insights there's a new knowledge about potential disease that i might develop and um, there's something maybe i can optimize and then we can always go back to the data and you don't need to repeat the test so i think um whole genome sequencing really is something where we should put way more focus on also in a clinical context and in a practical application and finally use data and i have to say i'm often quite shocked if I talk to people and I hear the amount of um, supplements they're taking dozens at a time and near mentioned yesterday that you know, it's questionable whether we really understand what all these medications are doing. And when we talk about longevity optimization, we need to understand what's going on in your body. And I'm shocked by the fact how many people are experimenting um, with off-label drugs, with supplements, with molecules, without even checking the baseline, without even checking um, changes in, in, their, um, in their body. And so using the data is critical for, for any longevity intervention. But um, when we talk about longevity and longevity data, we talk about a very complex field. And I yesterday briefly talked about that. Because what kind of data do we get when we talk about longevity? We get things like we, we talk about molecules. We talk about supplements we take, about drugs we take, about nutrition. We talk about exercise. We talk about lifestyle. We talk about wearables. We talk about sleep. We talk about habits. We talk about mental health. We talk about genomics. We talk about biomarkers, all these things. And that's all data that's very relevant for practical longevity optimization. And we cannot look at just some of these things in isolation. We really need to look at all of these things in combination. That means we generate a lot, a lot of data that's really hard and confusing to interpret, to measure, to capture, and to make good use of. And so essentially, that's what we do at Biolytica. So we have developed a health data platform called Biolytica Nexus, which we provide for clinics, for healthcare professionals, for um, preventive institutions that really allow them to capture all the data in combination. So the genomic data, the raw data, but also then through algorithms and the relevant pathways. Um, they can track and measure medications, which is important then for pharmacogenomics and checking is there anything that we might see which is not the best idea to take at the moment. Same for supplements. Um, we help them to track um, lifestyle data from their cli clients and patients. So we connect with over 500 wearables at the moment uh, to track everything, of course, from uh, movement, uh, continuous glucose monitoring, um, smart scales at home, smart blood pressure cuffs, really streaming live data, which is very, very relevant to understand the lifestyle of people. Um, we can track nutrition, which we all know diet is one of the things that's probably has one of the biggest impacts on health at the moment that we have, but it's very hard to measure because, and very hard to track because you can ask your, uh, your patients or your guests or your clients, however you want to call them, to do food journals. And um, if you've ever done a food journal, I can promise you, you're doing it exactly for two days and then you forget about it. You start lying to yourself. You start lying to your doctors. But um, no, taking your phone, taking the picture and then um, analyzing what's on the picture um, we can not only understand what the people are eating, but also we can see eating uh, patterns throughout the day, which then again is very important for optimization. We can track very simple things like biomarkers and essentially any kind of health data. And what we want to do with that data and what the service that we provide to our clients is we, decomple we decomplexify the data. We help our clients to make better use of the data, to make the data more understandable and to simplify it. And the way we do it, and just one example, is um, we have what we call this pathway matrix, which essentially is a representation of different pathways in your body. So we have on the top left, we have um, cellular pathways around methylation, oxidative stress, inflammation, um, detoxification. We have uh, systemic pathways around hormone health, um, around cognitive functions. We have um, cardiovascular pathways, for example, to the right. Uh, we have um, metabolic pathways. We have nutritional pathways, activity pathways. So what we do in our platform, we essentially pull together all the data from different sources, from the genomics, from digital biomarkers, from physical biomarkers, and we provide clinics with a tool that's 
in a way, it's in a simplified form. It's like the dashboard that you have in your car, where you can see, okay, um, engine light is, is going red, so you need to maybe check your engine, um, time to check your brakes, um, time to change your oil. So this is like a simplified tool to, in an easy way, see, okay, where do we see, for example, areas which are potentially, um, from a genetic perspective, where we can see some risk factors, nothing down here, but maybe here are some clusters up here where we can see genetically there might be something we want to have a closer look at. But then, of course, we need biomarkers to overlay onto that and to see, okay, what are areas that we might look at at a later point, oxidative stress, so we might have some medium genetic impact, but also some uh, medium biomarkers that are elevated. So let's look at that in the future. But there might be some things which are really standing out, for example, here in the area of detox. Um, someone might have um, very, in, well, very high impact uh, detox genes, plus maybe some elevated um, liver values, GGT or something like that. So that provides the clinician really with a tool to um, look at certain areas in an easier way, and then, of course, create more personalized interventions. So essentially what we do is we help clients, our clients, finding actionable insights. And um, whether you're using um, a platform like that or anything else, what I really want to stress is when you experiment on yourself, please do me a favor and really use the data that you have available. There's also other tools out there that you can use, but really make sure you're checking the baseline whenever you're introducing new inter interventions. Um, don't do them all at once. I know it's sometimes tempting um, if we get excited, but we, re we really need to make sure that we understand what's going on in our body and we have the data to use it. So in summary, um, three things. Make sure you don't die. Try to eliminate the risks as far as possible from your life. Try to eliminate the risks of an early death that can be avoided. There's many things um, that you can do. Um, whole genome sequencing, if you haven't done it, um, get it done. If you're a clinic, I would recommend to use it because you get an amazing amount of valuable information. Um, and finally, use the data really to your benefit. And if anyone has any further questions, then please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great talk, Rob. Uh, do we have uh, questions for for Rob? So I uh, I can ask a question. Which which data do you think is the most valuable? I think it's not just one specific type of data. I think it's the combination of three things: of the genomics, of um, traditional biomarkers and then wearable biomarkers because the genomics will give us the blueprint that we need to look at then um, other biomarkers whether it's blood biomarkers or other omics that we have like you know proteomics metabolomics and we can see what's actually happening um, but then also the wearable data gives us insights on the day-to-day -day activities and the lifestyle essentially of people and that's also then important to um, you know, see are the interventions working and you know, we talked about exercise before are people, people really doing the exercise um, are they up there up at their optimal range in terms of sleep, in terms of um, you know, uh, well, the way they train. So I think it's a combination of these three things. Very cool. More questions? We have a question here. Rob, um, the level of validation of genomics data mm -hmm. is at least rather variable. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with this uh, in terms of informing your clients about new papers that mm -hmm. came out on certain SNPs that are correlated or more or less correlated with disease. So how do you put brakes on unnecessary information to the people? Yeah, and it's uh, probably it's a question to, to ask our uh, geneticists and experts, but um, definitely nothing goes out without um, proper validation first. So it's, it's uh, important to really look at what are things that are maybe um, not relevant for them to know, but what are really things where we can um, find practical things for our clients. So we just no, don't overwhelm them with any information. That's also something where um, you often get providers where you have a report of 1,000 pages and no one is going to read that. So not the, the, clients, the, the patient's not going to read it, um, the doctor's not going to read it. So um, it's about filtering this information. And there's a human aspect, there's a team behind it that filters through that information. And then, of course, you know, we have to trust the team to do a good job in filtering the right information out. So, but it's not about overwhelming them with anything that we get. It's about what, what's really relevant for them and then providing that information. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. Welcome. Really appreciate your talk and your support.